Okay, it looks like almost everybody is in now. So we will start. Uh, my name is uh, Ken Pekrowski. I'm a uh, trustee of the Mawa Museum, also the chair of the uh, Les Paul Committee. Uh, this is uh, part of our Les Paul Legacy Series, and we are uh, delighted and honored to have uh, Jean Paul with us tonight. Uh, moderating tonight's discussion will be uh, Charlie Carreras. Charlie is uh, uh, the vice president of the Mawa Museum. He's also uh, professor emeritus of history at Ramapo College. So I will uh, turn this over to uh, Charlie right now. Charlie. Thank you, Ken. Uh, before I introduce our guest tonight, uh, I want to give you a little overview of the Mawa Museum, what we're doing, and uh, invite you to come by and see the museum. Uh, we are the Mawa Museum. We're in the uh, middle of Mawa, uh, near the New York State border, and let's see. Okay, this is what I wanted. Um, and uh, we open on Saturdays from one to four now. Uh, hopefully in a few months, if the pandemic changes, we'll be able to go back to our regular schedule, Wednesdays, Saturdays, and Sunday. Um, we're a town museum and we collect uh, and preserve artifacts, photographs, historical records, documents to tell the story of Mawa. And part of that story and, and what we're interested in tonight is the story of Les Paul, a resident of Mawa for 60 years. Um, we have uh, rotating exhibits currently, uh, uh, an exhibit on women's suffrage, women, women's right to vote, uh, Ramapo College celebrating its uh, 50th anniversary, Palisades Amusement Park, and we have the Levo Gallery. Permanent exhibit, the Donna Cooper Model Railroad, the old station in Caboose, and we feature Les Paul and Mawa. Um, both of these, uh, the Model Railroad and Les Paul comes to Mawa are very popular. We have people coming from far and wide to, to see those exhibits. Um, we have uh, lectures coming up uh, next month, uh, uh, January 4th on suffrage in New Jersey. Uh, this will be Zoom, January 23rd, also Zoom, starting a family tree, a webinar with Kathy Moran Hajo. And February the 20th, uh, History of the Palisades Amusement Park. We will be uh, putting in place, hopefully in April, a vinyl listening party outside at the museum uh, where we will uh, listen to a couple of uh, albums by uh, Les Paul and Mary Ford and hear commentary from Jean and Sean McLowry as to why these albums are the best that Les and Mary made. Uh, we invite you to think about helping us out at the museum. We are volunteer run. We need help in setting up exhibits, archiving, uh, welcoming uh, a, a guests at the museum and events, particularly when we can be live, uh, hopefully next year in the museum. Uh, we're always looking for new members and we're always looking for donations. Uh, in the museum store, we have a variety of uh, publications uh, related to our exhibits, uh, Palisades Amusement Park, for example, and uh, the very excellent uh, book uh, that's uh, sponsored and promoted uh, by the Les Paul Foundation. We have that available for sale at the museum as well. Uh, your stories are here. If you go to mawamuseum.org, you'll see there's a lot of information about the exhibit we have on Les Paul in the museum. And uh, we, we have a place on the website for you to tell your Les Paul stories. We invite you to go there and check that out and, uh, and leave us your stories. Okay, now, 
we'll go back to the regular screen and I will go back to Gene Paul and welcome him once again, uh, a good friend of the museum who's helping us out a lot to, to keep Les's memory and stories and legacy alive. We are indebted to you, Gene, and we thank you. And welcome once thank again. Thank you for having me. Good, thank you. Um, as I've been reading a father and his life and his successes, I'm intrigued by the question he's been asked, he was asked many times. Uh, an interviewer asked him, uh, how did he see himself? Whether he was an inventor, whether he was a musician, uh, how did he see himself? And he answered that he saw himself as an entertainer. And I was really intrigued by him by answering in that way. Uh, could you elaborate on that in terms of giving us insight to, to less and what made less tick? Well, it depends on, on who was sitting there at the time. <laughs> uh, Dad was never a, a Grammy announcer or anybody that uh, would rattle his own fame, you know. Uh, the, the best way I can put it is if you had the chance to see him in the last 25 years of his life, his his ability to play was diminishing because of the arthritis. His love to play was not. And his love and respect for the audience didn't diminish at all then either. And, and to answer your question, as his son, I saw him on the road. I played drums with him on the stage with Mary. And I've seen him play at the Iridium, at the uh, Fat Tuesdays. And I saw him on the road. Entertaining was his life. And part of the entertaining was communicating to his audience which he cherished. I mean, when he was done playing in Vegas, a show, he would go right out front, go to a couple of tables, sit down, talk with the people, sign autographs. There was nothing he wouldn't do for his audience. Uh, there was a, a time in Brazil, we were uh, doing a TV telecast and Mary and dad were done with the telecast and they were walking off to the side and a little fellow from deep down in Brazil came up to dad and he had a beautiful gourd. I mean, gorgeous, nylon strings, the whole nine yards. And he showed it to dad. And in his broken English, he said to dad that he wanted him to sign and get his autograph, would he do it? And he said, yeah, sure. Uh, got a pencil? No, 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 no. And he hands dad a screwdriver. And he says, he turns the guitar over, he points. <laughs> and this beautiful gourd, he wants dad to scratch his name in. <laughs> so, Dad, no, 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 you can't do that, you know. Well, finally, he, in his broken English, he got Dad to do it, and he signed it. And when he signed it, the guy was very pleased and everything, and he turned around and thanked Dad and started to walk away. And when he walked away a little bit, he turned around to Dad and he said, would you do me one other favor? And that's all you got to say to Dad. And he said, would you play it? And now there's a nylon, nothing to do with electric, yeah, another world. Dad said, sure. And he started to play the guitar and four or five other Brazilian guitar players <laughs> came up to him. And before 10 minutes got going, they were all sitting there jamming. 
It was one of the most beautiful moments. And, and the funny part is, is if you closed your eyes, even with the nylon gourd, it sounded like dad, which was really amazing <laughs> for me anyway, because I was used to the electric. But that's the way he was with the audience. He was that way with Fat Tuesdays. That's why he was uh, with the Iridium. Um, when the show is over, out in the audience. And the audience meant so much to him. So that's, that's the part of the audience and dad. And I, I believe his entertaining was my version of it, is, what I saw and what I know now is that that was his journey. And when he stopped off to make the guitar, it was because he couldn't go buy it. When he stopped off and did disc to disc recording, it was because he, he had it and he used it. You know, the only thing, the only thing he didn't need was the eight track. He never needed it at all. He was very happy. Matter of fact, somebody asked him that question and said, well, now less than you know, uh, sound on sound with the mono tape machine with the fourth head, and you now have created the eight track. What's your thoughts? And he thought for a minute and he said, I had more fun with sound on sound. The equipment was not anything but a tool to him. The guitar was a tool. The disc to disc was a tool. The sound on sound was a tool. That's the way he treated it because he had ideas inside of him that he wanted to put down and develop and he needed a vehicle, a vessel to do it with. And if it would have been Pro Tools at that time, he would have used that, you know? And because he didn't have it, he stopped, he paused and created it, which is highly unusual. <laughs> you know, to be an entertainer and pause to make a guitar <laughs> it's quite unusual, you know. And another another thing I'm intrigued about is the, the stories about all the travel that he did. I mean, driving from coast to coast and you traveled a lot with him. And of course you just referred to that just now. And And also while traveling, he would record on the road he would have the sound on sound machine in the trunk of his car. Were you with him when he used the sound on sound machine? No, and, no, no. That that it was episode, earlier. Yeah, that episode was a little earlier. However, we talked about it a lot because I always was interested in it. Because when I left the Nest, I went to work at Atlantic Records in New York. And I was a recording engineer there. And I was always puzzled by the fact that dad got sounds I couldn't get. And I'm not hearing anybody else get them either. And it bothered me. So I would end up after a session at two o'clock in the morning, I'd end up at the doorsteps knocking on the door and dad happened to be awake. <laughs> and and he, served uh, pop, he served you popcorn invited me in with popcorn yeah <laughs> and and we talked all night about the garage about how he recorded and mic'd in the garage and how he made the multiple recordings and it was just so interesting because um so many of these things i don't think people know and if you're in the recording zone at all, you know that you now have a microphone, you have EQ, you have compression, you have all of these tools uh, upon which to use. 
And when I went to dad and said, dad, how come I'm not getting this sound? I'm using the same mic and I'm not getting the same sound, why? And he said to me, he said, well, I don't like compressors. I don't like limiters. I don't like EQ. I said, well, you got a mic and a lathe in the old days. I said, how did you get the sound? He said, you pick the right mic that you want the frequencies to match the instrument or the vocalist, whatever, that you're recording. So he EQ'd with the microphone and he compressed with the microphone. He'd say to me, if you have an instrument that goes from such and such frequency to such and such frequency, the microphone shouldn't go beyond that. And in that way, you will capture the fundamental of the instrument. Therefore, you don't need compression or limiting. Well, I didn't realize that, but when we got into detail about how he made his records, I caught it because I was watching him do an overdub with the eight track. And when he was sitting there, he was adding a bass and he had three VU meters at that time. And one was the left side of the mix, one was the right side of the mix, and the middle one was what you were adding. So he was adding a bass that's on the center VU. And he watched the VU. And when the VU wasn't 100%, he knew to play that note louder. And I said to him, I said, what are you doing? And he explained it to me like that. And I said, what? Well, why don't you use a compressor? No, no, it changes my intent, my feel. So I won't use a compressor, but what I will do is notice and pay attention to the VU. And when my note's soft, I'll play a little louder next time. So he would record with EQ using the proper mic because back in the garage, it was the microphone it was a, a, a volume pot on the mixer and directly out to the cutting lathe. So there was nothing in the line. So he did all his shaping in the room. Now that's totally anti what is being done today. Because the minute you plug a mic in, right off the bat, the mic goes from 20 cycles in the bottom to 20K on the top. It's just a broad band and then you shape it with your tools. That's not what he did. So he recorded totally different and came up with a totally different sound. Good, good. So Ken, uh, you, have yeah. some, you have a question? A question for, one thing I want to clarify is that uh, we're, for anybody who wants to ask Gene a question, there's a Q&A at the bottom of the screen. So just um, enter your question, type in your question in our Q&A. And uh, we're going to, Charlie and I are going to be constantly monitoring that so that we'll get to your questions. So before I ask my question, uh, I do have a question from somebody. Yeah. That there's, uh, there's chat and q and I guess they can use either one. No, just use Q&A. OK, good. Go ahead, I'm sorry. Okay, we have one question. Uh, we're getting a little bit into the technical aspect of recording. Somebody is asking, what is EQ and VU? Uh, VU is the way to check the level of a particular source you're feeding in, whether it be guitar, bass, vocal, whatever. It keeps you in alignment so you don't get distortion uh, and you can track it. Uh, it's like an EKG of music <laughs> where you, you can see what's happening. You know, it gives you another view past your ears. You know, um, equalization is that way also. It deals with frequencies. So you could take a certain frequency range and move it up or down and take another frequency and, and you could shape it, you know. Now, when you do that, 
the problem is, is you have to have a reference point. So if you don't know what the music is about, you got a problem. But you, somewhere along the line, you have to realize that uh, when you take a microphone and put it properly on an instrument, you're collecting, you're supposed to be collecting what that instrument is telling you. Uh, when you go out in the room and listen to it, that's what you should be getting in the control room to start with. Now you can take that and shape it where you want. Most people start shaping it with the extra goodies, limiting, compression, all of these things. Other people go out in the room and change it out there. Either change the mic position. If you move a microphone a little bit in and out, you change the the uh, temperature of the sound. If you take an amplifier and change it to what you want, that's the truest way to record is when the source is saying something you're capturing. If you capture something that isn't right out in the room and try and reshape it, that gets risky. And you better know where you're going because that, that it changes things. So out in the room is the way dad did it. He did it. I said to him once, I said, how do you, you only got four mics and you got six players in the room. I said, somewhere along the line, you got a problem. So I said, how do you deal with like, if you don't have enough bass? He says, I tell the bass player to take one foot closer to the mic. And he, he dealt with the environment, meaning a symphony is delicious because it's all of them in a same room. And when you hear it, the engineer that balances these instruments is not an engineer. It's the musicians. It's the conductor. That's who creates the magic. When you get into a contemporary recording studio today, the conductor now moves from the room to behind the console. He becomes the conductor. The, in, the musicians no longer balance. It's now the engineer that balances. So now you got an interpreter between the music and the tape machine or the DAW, whatever. That's, that's the process. So you, you got to be careful that, that what is being created today, that's why dad once said, I enjoy the sound on sound better than I do the A track because he was born in the one take zone. He was, but when he, when he did uh, uh, the record with uh, Bing, long, long time, he sat down with Bing. They were all ready to go. They rehearsed a little bit, nodded to the guy in the other room. And dad said to Bing, what do you think? And Bing said, you're a little busy. The next take was it. That's the way he was brought up. When you, you asked before about the multiples, same thing. The multiples, he knew the tune before he sat down to record it. He had to, because technology wouldn't allow him to say, hold it, let's take it again. He couldn't do it. So, but all that considered, is technology allowing us now too many benefits? Was it better when we knew what we were going to do before we sat down? These are all interesting questions, but it bothered dad. I sat down with him once he was recording on the 8-track 
And I said to him, I said, why are you stopping? Well, you know, and I figured, okay. So I had to go and do dinner or whatever. So I went in the other room and dad came out for dinner and we sat down, had dinner, finished, went back in the studio and dad's sitting there overdubbing again. And I walked in the room and he stopped again. And I said, what's, what's up? And he said to me, uh, he says, I can stop. Now, I didn't know what he was talking about. I was 16 years old. Now I know what he's talking about. Because the equipment allows you the ability to stop, it got in the way of the creativity. And that's what Bing didn't like. That's what uh, Benny Goodman didn't like. He sat down with Benny Goodman one time and Les and Mary went to see Benny Goodman. They're in backstage talking to Benny Goodman. And Benny Goodman says to him, boy, what you guys are doing is absolutely incredible. And this was at the peak of their hits. And dad always admired the hell out of Benny Goodman. And, uh, but Benny Goodman said, you know, I wouldn't be caught dead doing that. Now this sprung a leak with dad. He had to stick around and find out what he meant. And in the conversation, Benny Goodman said, I don't want an engineer connected to my records. And dad said, what do you mean? You have to have one. He says, no, I don't. He said, you give me the fewest amount of mics and let my musicians mix it. He said, that's why Basie sounds like Basie. That's why Benny Goodman sounds like Benny Goodman because nobody is in between the band and the recording process. It's simple and they blend. That's where the magic is. So all of this comes back to the same place with dad. That's why his records people look at and are amazed to this day how he did it. He had it all in his head before he sat down to record. Now, what was there moves that took place inside of it? Sure. But he knew the tempo, the timing of the whole tune, the intro, everything. And then where something might lead him somewhere else, he'd go there. And when he cued, he couldn't EQ a guitar. So that's where he changed the speed. When he, when he slowed it down and then sped it up later, he got highs. That's how he EQ'd his records. When Mary used the 44 microphone to sing into, the 44 microphone, the RCA 44, is a very interesting mic because as you move in on it closer, it gives you more bottom. And when you back up from it, it's less bottom. So if he had a tune that she was singing high, he'd move the mic in. When she was singing low and had a good full voice, he'd move it back a little bit. He didn't need the bottom. And that's how he moved the mic with Mary. Well, this is, interesting because when I got to Atlantic, I was trying to figure out how in the hell was he getting these sounds? And any console you go to automatically has all of these things in it. With his console, it was the fader, it was the microphone, a volume pot, out. That was it. And that's the same way he did it with the sound on sound, with the mono ampex, with the fourth head. Same principle. Okay, we have uh, a couple questions. Uh, one question is, what patents did your father have? Did he have any? What's that? Patents. 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 Yeah. Uh, I don't know. I don't, I know he didn't have anything on the A-track. 
I think we have a, we have a copy of a government document in the museum, like from '57, some kind of special design on a guitar. That uh, it seems to be something that was registered, but he didn't. He didn't. He didn't patent most of his things, right? <laughs> That's because he was too busy entertaining. <laughs> <laughs> People always think of Dad as an inventor first. And the inventor part came about because he had to pause and get something to complete his adventure. And that that's what he did with it, you know. Uh, so I know the A track, he could have gotten involved in that and he didn't. He was just, he was so happy to create something. And and it's it, this is weird to say, but something he didn't need. But he, I really look at the eight track as a gift to the next generation. That's the way I look at it. That's what I think he did because he, he would say to me, you'd have to be stupid to do what I did. And when I got old enough to understand what the hell he was talking about, I would laugh with him because it was crazy to go from disc to disc. And it was crazy, disc to disc. You had, you would record a part on one disc, then you'd record a part on the other disc, adding what you did on the first disc. So then you become two parts. Then you take that and go back and forth. Well, you always had the prior disc to back up to. Now, the only problem is you can't take this on the road with you. But that's how he recorded. So this gave him a benefit. He could back up. Sound on sound did not give him that benefit. It took it away. Because as you recorded the first part, then you go for the second part. It played it back. You had the chance to record your next part on the tape. But it erased the first part. And now you have no place to go back. So that's why he said you have to be crazy to do what I did. Can you have another question? I do have another question. Um, for the benefit of this, there may be some people who are, are not as familiar with less as a lot of people are. So I'm just trying to go back to the beginning. That is, um, uh, when did his interest in uh, sound recording start? Uh, did it start when he was living in California or was it before that? I know he was experimenting with uh, guitar design and uh, sound amplification. Uh, when he was in uh, Wisconsin, um, but it seems like, particularly like in 1943, when he moved to California from New York, that that's where his interest really took off. Is is that is that accurate? That's that's when he really be when when he really became interested in recording is when he was doing long long time with Bing, because when he finished the recording, Bing, Bing was aware of dad's talent, not only as a guitar player, but with sound. And Bing asked him to go on a ride with him after they finished recording. And he went on a ride and he's going down wherever in Hollywood. Uh, and, and dad said, what are you looking for? What, where are we going? And Bing said, I want to find a building for you and give you a studio. You really, really are good. And I want to see if maybe we come up with a, a building you'd be happy with and we'll build a recording studio. And dad didn't want to get tied down by that. So he turned him down. However, when he got home, his buddies were sitting there, asked the question, how did the session go? He said, great done with, it's a hit. And they asked, well, what took so long? He explained, and they both said to him, well, 
what if we took the garage and built a studio out of it? So you could experiment, do whatever you're going to do, you know. And, and I believe this was a little bit before his mother laid on him the comment, <laughs> which was, gee, Les, you sound like everybody else, <laughs> you know. And so they put together a studio. Now, prior to that, as a young kid, dad was bugged with the fact that when he played the guitar, he couldn't be a critic because he was playing it. So that's where he got involved in the Cadillac flywheel and his father's garage. And you guys got one of the lathes there <laughs> at the museum, which is, you know, one of those uh, Edison light bulbs, you know, it's a cherished thing. And, and that's when he created the idea that he wanted something to record it on so he could listen to it as a pedestrian would and see what the hell he sounds like not playing. That was the start. Then when he got to Chicago and he was uh, doing his radio station stuff and then he got involved with the jazz, he wanted to find out what the jazz trio sounded like, stepping away from it. And he used the lathe there and did some cutting and that was not anything technical, but he just wanted to hear what he was doing. And that led to the garage in California, which was the story with Bing. And at that time, he didn't have the inspiration of his mother yet, but what he did want to do is understand recording. So he took about I don't know, three quarters of a year, a year, and did nothing but record everybody that walked in the, in the backyard. If somebody came over to the house, if Bing came over to the house, is do not collect anything, go right to jail. They went right to the garage. So anybody who had talent ended up in the garage and he would record them. I heard some things he did with, I believe it was the Mulcahy's, uh, harmonica. Uh, he, he had a recording of a bass harmonica that was absolutely stunning. And I would listen to that. He'd bring out the acetates, put them down, we'd listen to them. And I would just be, where did you get that sound? So he spent the year not with the multiples. That came afterwards. But he spent the year looking and researching microphones, a mixer, what is the cleanest way to record something? And then how do you use a cutting lathe? Because that was just before uh, the tape machine came into being with, with Bing. So he's trying to learn the cutting lathe. Well, the cutting lathe is a, a big problem because uh, not the proper grooves, this, that, and whatever, and you can get in trouble real quick with a cutting lathe. So he had to learn that to keep and make a real good clean recording. And that's where it started with the garage. And then after that period is when his mother made the comment when he was on the road with uh, the Andrew sisters in Chicago uh, and drove him back to California to reconsider <laughs> his guitar sound <laughs> and how he was recording. And at that time, he did some recordings with the, with the trio and everything. But he wanted to come up with something really unique. And that's where he started to play with the idea of recording himself many times. And the great part is, is that he had a low impedance guitar he always liked and he used that. So he went directly into the console, everything matched properly and the sound was incredible. And the result was his music. 
you know, uh, back in those days, like I said, no compressor, no EQ. Me just, this is a, what you see is what you get. And then that's how he would create it. And he started with the experiments after the recording of everybody else, the experiments of how do I layer it? What happens? And he invited, I, I think uh, in Lover, uh, he had a, a, a live bass player on it. And after that, he didn't because he figured he could play the bass on his guitar. So that's how that changed. Okay, because that, that kind of leads me to one of the questions is that uh, someone wants to know who played, actually this is our friend Steve Lucas, who played bass on the Lesson Paul recording uh, and you explain what instrument he used and why. Can you elaborate on that? Uh, you're talking about Lover now? I think it would be Lover. Lover is the one he had uh, an upright bass player. Yeah, I don't know who that was. Uh, and, and again, I wasn't there, so it's hard for me to get into, you know, raw details on it. But uh, he, he felt at that point that he wanted to try that. And then as he got more confident about doing the parts himself, he realized that you're not going to be able to explain the intent of the bass part to somebody else. Mm. So he played it. Did, did, did he use a bass player on, on other recordings? I don't think so. I don't now. I'm not sure on that, but I don't think so. You know, uh, he would use a piano player once in a while, a uh, drummer once in a while, but not very rarely. I mean, he would end up playing percussion on the on the guitar. Mm. You know. Yeah. Uh, you may have touched on this, Gene, but I'm going to ask the question anyway. Uh, how did Les uh, figure out each mic's frequency response? Trial and error. Uh, a lot of trial and error, uh, microphones came with specs, so you had some basic idea of it. Uh, but with Dad, it was really trial and error because it's nice people would give you some information, but he had to know for himself, you know. Okay. Um, one question that I have, um, when, uh, when Mary and your dad were, were recording How High the Moon in their Queens, New York apartment, right. um, what were some of their challenges when <laughs> getting that, that song? Uh, a 200 pound guy running across the, the ceiling, <laughs> uh, an airplane, uh, a fire engine. <laughs> the problem is he, he the benefit of having sound on sound with the Ampex with the extra head was that unlike a, a cutting lathe <laughs> that you need a crane to move around, he could take the tape machine and go. So the minute he got hold of the tape machine, he realized that now we can record anywhere. Well, anywhere ended up at this particular spot and he ended up doing How High the Moon in Jackson Heights and ran into the guy walking across the floor in the middle of the night and the sirens and airplanes. And they had a couple good takes on it. And Mary was going bananas because she didn't think she could get it that way again. And okay, dad talked her into it, but he said, listen, what we have to do here is isolate you a little bit. And he came up with the idea of putting a blanket over her and <laughs> to kill the outside sound, which it helped and it did. Unfortunately, what happened is that when you put a blanket over somebody, you kill the room, you kill the atmosphere. So he didn't have any atmosphere. And so she was really dead, you know, it was a dead sound. And when you do multiple voices, he would refer to it as glue. 
He wanted something to tie these voices together. Well, part of it has to do with the room ambient sound and all that stuff. And, and that's how he kind of got away with it because he'd do one vocal close, the lead, he'd do a, a harmony vocal a little further away and it, it developed a coherent thing. Well, he couldn't do that there with a blanket over her head. So that was one of the, the spots in which he created Echo. So he put a speaker out in the hallway, a microphone down the hallway, sometimes in a bathroom, and he would change the dimension between the two to create the echo timing that he wanted. And he would add that to her mic, and that became a tool for the, the uh, coherence of the many vocals that you did. Because I think she did, I think she did 12 vocals on that tune and dad did 12 guitar. It was 24 parts, mm -hmm. you know, uh, and, and that's the way he kind of did it. Uh, I asked him that one time, I said, well, how do you, how do you lay the parts out? Because now you, if you come from an engineering world, now make it simple. There's a there's a, a a a problem when you have 24 pieces, the elements of the of the tune. Somewhere along the line, somebody has to show up and give balance to them. <laughs> so as he recorded the parts, he not only had to add the right notes and everything else to it but he also had to pick the right level for it. Well, if you're talking about, I'm going to put one part on at a time, and when I get done, I can't go back. You better know what the hell you're doing. <laughs> and that was, that was another part of it that threw me was the fact that Mary would sing, if he's doing four part harmony, she would sing the last part first. And then the next part, next part, and the last part they'd put on the record is her lead vocal, the lead guitar, and the bass. Because as you do 24 parts, frequencies also change because you're doing over and over and over and the imperfections of the tape and the process to record it would shift levels. So now he had to compensate for that. So he figured out, well, the first thing you put on the record is a bass, rhythm, guitar, and bass. No, you can't. So he'd have to put the bass on next, the last, last, for balance, because the bass was very important in the balance of the tune. So that's how he made the records. And that's why he said, you'd have to be crazy to do what I did. <laughs> <laughs> Got a couple of other questions out there. Uh, what are the four mics that uh, your dad used in the garage in California? Uh, the Ribbon 44 was his favorite. As time went on, he got to another favorite and that was the Telefunken 47. Those two mics, he could live the rest of his life with. He didn't need any other ones. Uh, he had a whole slew of mics, uh, an eight ball, a ribbon, uh, a lot of ribbon mics he used. You know, he used some dynamics, but a lot of ribbon mics. He, he loved the fact that ribbon mics gave him the flexibility to, in essence, EQ, because proximity would change, the sound would change. He could use that as a tool. And that's, that's what he did with a lot of those, you know. Uh... Okay, um, another question. Uh, did, 
uh, did your dad invent this all about a guitar or did he, did he just perfect it? <laughs> well, when you figure that, that he started out as a young kid wondering, and he started with a train trestle, <laughs> a, a block of steel for a train track, and he, he really was puzzled about the fact that he wanted the string to ring forever. He wanted all the wonderful, delicious tones out of that string he could get. And it took him from that time as a young kid, which he was in probably his teens, all the way up to it was 1950, early 50s, where he finally connected with Gibson. And in between that time, he got bored and he wanted a guitar. And he went to Gibson, told me idea. They said, you're crazy, goodbye. And he still wanted a guitar. So he went to Epiphone and he built a guitar. They gave him the privilege to go in the joint. They knew he played guitar. They respected him and everything. And at night, you got it. Take the place, Les. And off he went. And he built the log, which if you don't know what it is, look it up on the net. <laughs> it's, it's another one of these Rube Goldberg, wow, where did this come from? We'll have and, the log at the museum. It come there. <laughs> soon as soon as the virus come yeah. there. That that is one of the most impressive moves he made because he just was not gonna wait. Uh Epiphone even came to him and, and wanted to sign him up and he wouldn't do it. He had his eyes on one place, Gibson. And why, whatever, he just had his mind up, that's where he wanted to go. So he waited. But that is the log he created. And then finally he went to the Epiphone and he created a guitar that, that I, I think all of the kits were made on the Epiphone. You know, not one was made with the Gibson that I know of, you know. Uh, and, and then finally, when he got to the Gibson, it became the idea he had was he worked out the electronics, he worked up the pickups, and he had a concept of this works. Uh, even though he experimented with uh, metal guitars, he, nothing slipped by this guy. It, it's almost like when you hear about Edison where he said, it took me 2000 mistakes to find the right way. They weren't mistakes. That's how he found the right way. Mm -hmm. Same thing with dad. When he made the metal guitar, total disaster. But it was the bridge to get to the end. So when he got to Gibson, he really walked into Gibson with the guitar. The frame of the guitar. The body of the guitar was a composite between Gibson and him, back and forth till they found something they were they really liked. You know, uh, I know it was said that uh, uh, I think Dad said it, it might have been McCarthy, uh, McCarthy, uh, the uh, uh, head guy at Gibson, but they said I want the body of the guitar to be like a woman's body. And they went back and forth till finally they got it. And when they got it, dad got the first guitars, the pre-run, and he was absolutely in heaven. He finally got what he dreamt about. And he didn't kid around when he said he dreamt because he, he, he wanted Gibson to do it. And when they finally came to him, he, I got a video of him where he said, if I had to wait 10 more years, I would have waited 
because I believed in the electric solid body guitar. And that's, again, I say the phrase over and over, that's who he was, you know. Um, but he, he found the guitar, he put it together, that's what he wanted. And now he wanted to transfer that inside the Gibson. And it took them to say yes, and then they, they were afraid of it. So much so, uh, what, we, what name you want to put on it? <laughs> and Dad stood up and just said, call it a Les Paul. <laughs> but they, wouldn't, they didn't want to put their name on it. They thought this was, you know, this was really out there. Mm. So when, to answer your question, the first half of it was him. The second half was a collaboration. And from there on, uh, as long as he was still involved with Gibson, he would make them toe the line because he'd find things that he didn't like and he would make sure that they were corrected. Don't you, don't you think Gibson came to less because he was so popular, so well known? He was, he was the lead guitarist of his time, selling the most records. And so as he was doing these kind of creative things, they wanted him to help them, them market it. It's like Michael Jordan when he signed on with the tennis shoes for Nike. I, I, I believe that when you look at it uh, that way, you're correct, yes. I think Gibson was uh, hung up with the fact that he was so successful, so unique, and had such a, a wonderful sound that it compelled them to offer it to him, you know. Uh, Dad never looked at it that way. <laughs> he just looked at it like, well, it's about time, <laughs> you know. He did I, can't, I can't remember how many times he took me up to the, uh, the plant. Kalamazoo? Uh, yeah, in Kalamazoo uh, to see the plant. Uh, it would, it just, he was, he was, that was one of his dreams that totally came true, you know, and he, that's why when he ended up getting the award and everything, the inventor's award, uh, he really cherished that. And, and all the other awards he had respect for, but they went in the office and he didn't, you know, march around them every night. He didn't care about that stuff. But when he got the uh, inventor's thing, that really meant a lot to him. Got another question out there, uh, Gene. There were many dire direct to disc recordings that were produced in the 1970s. Did your dad ever record in this format? No, not that I know of. No, in the, uh, in the later years, he used the eight track. You know, it, it was uh, it, it 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 was good what he did. I don't think it. I I, I know I got caught it. It's weird because when I put the website together, uh, commercial lespaulremembered.com, uh, it was interesting because I had to verify a lot of my thoughts that I had because. Uh, I wanted to make sure that I was quoting something correct. And I found a video of him and, and an article also of it, where he said that having a chance to look back at what I did and, and really not be connected to it now, and this was in his later years, there was something about the 45, 1945 to 1958, that zone had a feel, a sound, something special about it that I can't duplicate now. So to answer your question, Kind of, <laughs> uh, 
stereo was great, eight track was great, but there was a time in which he owned it. And 45 to the mid 55 ish, so in that zone, uh, he owned it. And the ideas flowed, the ability to create flowed. And when he got to the other end of it, it was different. It was good, but it was different. And he even recognized that, you know. And, and maybe we can have another commercial for, for the April program, the vinyl listening party, that uh, one of the albums you selected was 1955. And uh, so we had a conversation about why you thought that album was better than, as a recording, better than earlier ones. Well, he, at, at, at some point he got involved with, with, when stereo came in, everybody loved it. Didn't know how to deal with it and loved it. And then after you do a couple albums with stereo, you found out, well, it's nice to put one guy over here and one guy over here, but musically it separated what was happening. Now you got to remember all the hits that dad had were mono. So even though you can listen to them and you think you hear stereo, you're hearing mono. When he got the stereo, he got caught up in that zone of stereo. And the sound moved and the coherence of the sound of the song moved. It didn't sound like one. And back with his old recordings, it was one. So he went through a phase there of learning with the echo. You know, he, again, he had all the technology he ever needed or wanted. And I, I, he wondered if he needed it all. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, we're, we're just over an hour. So um, I would like to thank everybody for joining us tonight. Uh, and a special thanks to uh, our guest, uh, Gene Paul, and that uh, Gene will always be involved with the museum in one way or another. So um, we look forward to a continued relationship with you. Um, also, as a little bit of a commercial, please visit the uh, Mawa Museum. We are open on Saturdays from uh, one to four. Uh, we have all these protocols to make sure that uh, you're safe when you come into the building. Come see all the exhibits. We have uh, uh, an exhibit on Ramapo College, its 50th anniversary, the 100th anniversary of the women's right to vote, Palisades Amusement Park, uh, also the Donald Cooper um, model railroad setup. And of course, the Les Paul exhibit with all the stuff that a lot of the stuff that we've been talking about tonight. Uh, please consider join, uh, donating to the museum. Uh, you could do that by going to the Mawa Museum website, mawamuseum.org. There's a big red button on the top of the screen. Uh, and also consider uh, joining the museum, uh, $20 for an individual membership, $30 for a annual family membership. Uh, again, I thank you and have a safe and wonderful play, play holiday. The, play the guitars. Play the guitars. And, and also play the guitars. <laughs> play the guitars. Uh, you can get the information on the website. Uh, almost every guitar that, and we have a lot of guitars on uh, in the exhibit. Uh, almost all of them are available to play, um, and some very special ones. Owned by Les Paul and played all, by Les Paul. All owned and signed, autographed by Les Paul. And the people who have done this um, uh, in the past, it, it's been a, a wonderful experience for them. They all have expressed how much thrill they get in, in playing those guitars. So, uh, so uh, that's available to you as well. Go to the uh, Mawa Museum webpage and uh, it'll give you all the information you need uh, to set up a reservation. Thank you all for coming and good night. Thank you, Gene. Thank you.